Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Matthew Carey. The SAG After Foundation has a COVID 19 relief fund to support SAG After artists with basic needs like rent, food, and healthcare costs during this global pandemic and industry shutdown. Donations are 100% tax deductible and directly support performers in dire need. Information on how you can support this effort can be found in the description of the video. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Chiwetel Ejiofor. Hi, hi, thank you, nice of to be here. Of course, uh, the audience, you know him for his Oscar-nominated work in 12 Years a Slave. He's appeared in American Gangster with Denzel Washington, did the voice of Scar in the recent Lion King uh, live action remake. But we're here today to talk about his latest achievement, which is earning an Emmy nomination as Outstanding Narrator for the documentary, The Elephant Queen. And this is a film in which uh, we track the story of Athena, a 50 year old elephant matriarch who is leading a herd to safety uh, when the water holes around her, this is in a, a park, a nature park in Kenya are drying up. It's quite fascinating to learn about that process of all the decisions and weight that is upon the shoulders of, uh, of Athena, this matriarch. And uh, it, the film is directed by Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone, and it is uh, streaming exclusively on Apple TV Plus. So congratulations on your nomination. Thank you very much, thank you. What does that, what does that mean to you to be recognized for your work? Well, it's, it's, it's exciting for the, for the, you know, for the project, you know, to be, to be recognized in that, in that way. And, uh, you know, like any of these things, it's so collaborative always. And, uh, and in this particular case, you know, the, the images and, um, and the story that was being told was so striking and so remarkable that, uh, that just to sort of be able to speak alongside it, you know, just to be able to talk of these magnificent animals was such a kind of rich experience. So I really feel like in a nomination, in, an, in a narration broadly, you know, it's all of those things that really, um, that really sort of come together. Hmm. And, uh, and that's what's exciting about it. Yeah, I, I met the directors uh, last fall. They did a screening in Los Angeles and uh, they talked about working with you on the film. But uh, tell me how you became involved in the project. Well, I was just, um, you know, I was sent the, um, the materials on it. You know, um, they had a kind of, a, you know, they had all of the visuals were there. So I saw the film. Uh, and they had a kind of, I think, uh, just a sort of temp narration, which was, which was, I thought was very strong. I think Mark had done it himself or somebody else had done it maybe. And um, it was very, uh, it was just very rich and you could immediately feel and sense what they were, what they were going for. And so then it was a question of having a conversation with them, with Victoria and Mark. And we started to talk through the certain kinds of narrations that, we like, you know, what kind of narrations were appropriate for this, you know, um, what sort of style it was, um, and how to kind of try and get a bit of, you know, sort of fluctuation um, to really um, story tell in the narration. And so we began that sort of process. And then it was just a question of going in and having a few um, recording sessions. Hmm. It's interesting, the uh, opening credits say told by Chiwetel Ejiofor, which is very interesting. It doesn't say narrated. And I think this gives us some sense of the mood and feel that they're going for, that they see your role as the storyteller. Is that how you perceived it? Yeah, absolutely. That it's a, that it's a very kind of collaborative um, process. And, you know, they had had such a kind of painstaking journey with this film, you know, and just being there with Athena, with the elephant for so long and with the other animals and, you know, digging these trenches underground and, you know, really waiting for, for these moments of magic to happen and these beautiful images, these extraordinary visual occurrences, you know, um, all the way through the film that they had painstakingly kind of realized over a long period of time. And, and it was that approach, you know, that they also brought into trying to get um, a narration that really sat in with that, that felt considered, that felt that, uh, um, that it was involving the audience into something that was very 
very special and had been kind of nurtured and, and looked after for a long time. Mm. And it's, it's interesting that uh, the balance that you have to strike because in a sense, you're conveying information, and this is a nature film, but it's certainly not clinical. Uh, tell me about the moods that you're striking at various times, because there's humor in it, there's drama, there's whimsy, there's, there's many different notes and flavors, if you will. Yeah, I think that's um, what the, um, that was the sort of brief, if you like, that was the, um, you know, that it was, you know, it was going to have to move, it couldn't, it wouldn't be a sort of flat narration. It was going to have to evolve as well. Um, it'd have to go on a journey. It'd have to sit alongside all of these different, these different sort of magnificent creatures and, and their experiences. Um, and so there was room and there's kind of, and there's room in the visuals, you know, to kind of, to have that sense of whimsy. I mean, nature is like that, but also there are moments of terror and there are moments of high drama, and and there are moments of um, of sort of I, I guess profound beauty and wonder, you know. And um, you know, I think there's a moment in the in the, in the elephant graveyard as the elephants gather around um, to respect the dead, the dead elephants, you know, which is um, such a remarkable thing in nature, anyway, and a, a remarkable thing that they were able to capture. And then to sort of place that in the the sort of wonder of that in in the voice as well was um, was a really great opportunity to to just look at different ways of um, of telling story in the voice and of allowing yourself as a narrator to be to be moved and to be involved and to be awestruck you know and all of those things which the film was able to to do. Well, it is visually absolutely stunning. Um, well, let's talk about some of the logistical aspects, if you will, of it. Where did you record the the, the voiceover? So we recorded in in London, in uh, in in Soho. Um, uh, so just in a in a kind of we have a sort of a smallish a smallish studio, um, and so and we were all. Um, for a lot of it, I, we were in the room together. You know, there were sometimes in the other. You know, there's always that sort of partition. Um, the technical crew were in the other room, and then the soundproof studio, which was quite large, and sometimes they were able to be in there, so we could really talk. And we had the film playing, you know, right in front of me on this uh, on a large flat screen TV. So, um, so, and so it was possible at times to just to really go into the narration very directly, you know, as opposed to kind of laying down lines, sort of wild, that were then added to images later on. It was just really sort of trying to place it right there and then, really. Yes, I was wondering what, what visuals you were looking at, because it certainly seemed to me to be ideal, maybe even imperative, to be looking at, at what you are talking about, because the, the narration is not completely explicit in the sense that, as a viewer, we're combining what you're saying with, with what we're seeing on screen. So you don't tell us, and here comes a tortoise walking mm -hmm. through the screen. So, but then you need to be able to see what's going on. So it makes sense to me that they, they would have that available. Yeah, to you. It doesn't always work like that, you know, sadly. I mean, it, it often does, to be fair, but it doesn't always work like that. And sometimes you are finding yourself working with stuff that hasn't been completely sort of, you know, finished. The visuals haven't been finished, haven't been completely done. And so you're you know, you're trying to sort of imagine or be talked through what is going to, what it's going to look like. But it is incredibly helpful, obviously, to be able to, um, just to be able to feel it moment to moment and to be able to be involved passionately in, in, the, in the images. I imagine some of the things you were talking about with Mark and Victoria, the directors, were the pace. How did you settle on a pace that felt right for this? Because it's, it's not a fast narration. Um, yeah. you know, it's, there's this deliberate pace to it, I, I would say. Yeah, I think, I mean, I really credit Victoria and Mark, you know, for, um, for, for, for their work on, on that, um, especially, you know, the, um, I think their understanding of pacing the narration was really, was really strong, you know, and, um, and, you know, I think that really, um, I think that really helped in telling the story, you know, and I think it's because, you know, you can do some narration where you are just at the pace of the events, 
you know, uh, or and in this case, you would be at the pace, I suppose, of the of the animals. You would be at the pace of whatever their drama is in that specific moment. Uh, and I think that that can work quite well. But I feel like in you know, with that very strong directing, you know, you can find all those moments to go against the pace of what's of the images that you're seeing to either speed up in, in, in sort of in slower moments, if you like, or slow down in the more dramatic bits, you know, to sort of vary what you're doing and to, to make it um, slightly unpredictable and to, um, you know, so the audience is, is really reaching a little bit to find and to uh, just to continue to grasp the story and to be sort of continue to be dragged into the narrative without feeling sort of lulled into a sense of the familiar. You know, mm. Because I guess there's always a danger with narration that you can kind of end up being very evenly paced throughout the whole thing and, you know, and it all fits into a kind of... Um, preordained space you know and uh, uh, and the audience can sometimes maybe just sort of switch off after a while because they're so sort of used to this kind of being sort of lulled so trying to find that kind of variation that sort of spontaneity was something that I think Victoria and Mark really really excelled at and really looked to very specifically. Mark wrote the script who's also the cinematographer um, did you give him any feedback on any of the lines? Like, well, I don't know about this word or, or whatever, or, you know, you're, you're just going with what they wrote. Yeah, I don't remember doing that. I mean, maybe. I mean, I'm, <laughs> it, would, it would seem like me somehow. But uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't specifically remember that. But, the, um, but I feel like for me, it's always, um, you know, it's always trial and error. You know, it's always that thing of, you know, you're, 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 you're there, you're, sort of prepared and you kind of, um, and then you're engaged. And if somehow it's just not working, you know, somehow it's just stuck. It just doesn't feel like, you know, cause it, it is that thing. It's got to do what it's got to do. You know, it's that, it's that idea. And, uh, and if it's just not happening somehow, then, you know, you do sometimes have to go back to, um, to, to pick it apart a little bit and to see whether, it is the wording, it is the pacing, it is the, you know, the, even potentially the way the images fit together that is kind of interrupting something and, and uh, making it feel forced or disjointed or uh, problematic somehow. So, um, you know, so I'm sure we, there were conversations, you know, I'm sure there were, but I can't really recall immediately which ones they were, which specific bits, but it would seem, yeah, that, that would happen. Yeah. Interesting. I would think it also was a relief maybe to be able to do this in your own accent. In other words, you're not having to play an American as you often do in, in movies and that sort of thing. Was that sort of a bonus that you can be you in effect? Yeah, I mean, I think you're always finding a character somehow, you know, like um, I think you're always trying to because you're, I think, in your voice, you are, you, you, you know, you are there, you know, and you are, um, you are knowledgeable about all of these elements, and you are, um, you know, you have, you, you are just so completely sort of invested in your voice, and that, and that, I think, wraps around a certain persona, that, um, that I think you are kind of creating. I mean, obviously. I watched the film several times before doing it, and I was and I was blown away, and I was invested. But there was something else, you know, that you can't be purely in awe, you know, because you have your as a narrator, you sit back from that a little bit, and uh, you know, it's it's placed in a certainly and just in a sort of slightly different category, and so you know, you have to create what kind of narrator you are, I suppose, mm. um, and and. Um, and that can be performative, essentially, you know, that that, that isn't um, just me turning up on the day. That is, that can be something that is, um, that is considered because I feel like some narration is more excited and some narration is more awed and some narration is more professorial and some narration, you know, and, and the list goes on. And so, um, so that bit of it, I think, was, a, was the kind of decision making that was involved. You know, I was quite curious about that of, as you approach it, you know, are you, are you thinking of, you know, this is just me and I'm just reading it or, or are you in a sense creating a character 
Um, it's an interesting kind of balance there, I think. Uh, and this, well, and also, what, when that character is broken, you know, when you when you break through those moments and your voice does sound surprised or you know just sort of more deeply engaged or you know or more in, involved in the drama or the you know um, potentially the, 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 the pain of a situation or the the wonder of a situation and, and making those choices of when to kind of break that character a little bit and and show a, a bit a bit a bit of something different are there narrators that you admire other people who do voiceover narration, be it for documentary or, or other kinds of perhaps fiction films as well? Well, I mean, obviously, as, you know, from the UK, you know, uh, Attenborough <laughs> is, you know, has been a kind of, you know, is, has been all of my life, really, the sort of foremost narrative voice in terms of nature and um and and uh, and, and documentary nature documentaries in that way as well as the presenters you know david Attenborough did a lot of pre uh, presenting as well and so um so in a way i think for anybody um who grew up listening to him and you know um and is, is sort of involved in anything to do with um, nature documentaries you kind of that's always a sort of benchmark and you know you 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 sort of recognize what that i suppose what that style is you know and and mm. how um uh, and how rich that style can be and how specific that style is as well and so you don't want to sort of emulate it because it's so recognizable in a way but you know where that is and and then you know i mean there are i think morgan freeman has done some extraordinary work in in narration um and um you know, I think he has, uh, and, he, and he, in a way, with the, the richness of his tone and the, the, the nature of how he invites one into the, the, the world that he's, that he's talking about, um, I think has kind of set a, a, a standard for, um, for how much a narration can engage and involve the audience. So I think there are extraordinary examples out there of people who are able to communicate so richly in this in this arena oh, yes those are two great examples and of course um uh Edinburgh is nominated along with you it's an interesting <laughs> group of uh of people who were nominated kareem abdul jabbar angela bassett are among the other nominees so lupisa yeah. yes it's quite a quite an interesting diverse group yeah, wonderful. What's your your regimen for getting ready uh, on the on a day when you're going to be doing voiceover? Well, it's a. I think it's the same as kind of any um, any performance. You know, um, you know. I just I feel that it's about being relaxed. You know, and being prepared. And those two things kind of <laughs> combined in a way. You know, they are connected very deeply. Um, so for me, I think it's always just about trying to um, just sort of take it easy in the morning, make sure you find yourself in plenty of time, you know, because everything that you do in the morning, you carry into your voice, you know, it's like, um, so, you know, and it's, and it's always that difficult thing that you don't want to get to that point where you're only really starting earnestly you know only really starting at mid-morning you know at 11 30 is when you're warmed up you're ready you, you calm down you you know you're over the fact that you've missed the first bus and you know and all of that and so um you know you kind of want to make sure that you're totally um you're totally sort of calm about it but you are very sort of knowledgeable and aware of what you're going to try to communicate and one of the the good things as well with this is just how open Mark and Victoria were to having conversations beforehand, you know, so that there was also an awareness of what was, what was going to, what the attempt was, what we were attempting to achieve in the, in the vocal quality. And, um, and, you know, I think you have to also be prepared not to get it right, you know, a few times, you know, and to not, you know, just to not give yourself a hard time um, because it is quite difficult to get those things right and to get those kind of tonal qualities right and um uh, and you might find that you have to repeat things quite a lot and uh, and in a way if you were doing that in any other form you know if you were doing that as in television and film 
you know, you would be sort of invited to be quite frustrated with yourself somehow, you know, um, that you couldn't quite get there and you need another take or it's been a few takes now and you're not there yet and you've got to try and do it. But I think with vocal work, it's a very different rhythm, you know, because, you know, you can't always quite hear how your voice is being, is transmitted, you know. Mm. Uh, and it does take a little bit of time to sort of lock that in and to listen back to things and to realize how it's sort of being, how it gauges and how it, um, just what it's communicating, really. Mm. Um, and whether that's accurate, whether it's what you want to communicate or whether just you need to fine tune it so that what you think you're doing is actually what you're doing. You know, we've all heard ourselves <laughs> on the answer machine or whatever or on the phone and thought, who's that, you know? And, um, and it's that sort of thing. You kind of have to get used to um, modulating your voice so what you say is what you think you say. Very interesting. And uh, do you do vocal exercises beforehand? Do you drink tea? You know, what are that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, just to warm up the voice a little bit, you know, um, uh, and um, yeah, just to make sure that you're, yeah, that you feel that you feel at ease, basically. Um, plenty of and plenty of water, of course, you know. Um, and um, and you know, inevitably, that is something that will sort of happen. That your your you know your voice will dry out a little bit, and um, you know, and that. But then that can be good as well, I think. You know, and that can be an opportunity to, um, you know, just to kind of further to further relax, really. Um, once it, once you're sort of starting to think about other things, you know, mm. once you start to think about your voice getting tired or whatever, you know, then actually you might be ending up doing something that isn't trying to be performative, that isn't trying to work on, you know, uh, the performance too much, but is actually, it's sort of internalized now and you're concerned about other things and it might give it a, a nice flow. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but as you're, as you're talking, it does strike me and also thinking about the narration that you did for the film, that you you really have to be quite centered. Uh, there's a, a real feeling of presentness in in what you're saying. Yeah, and I, and I think in a way that has to reflect the subject matter as well, inevitably, you know. Um, and it's it's choosing the voice and the tone that reflects, you know, the, what your the, what the visuals are and what the story is, what the story narrative are, and, and it is, and you know, and because of the kind of gravitas, the inherent gravitas and experiences of these elephants, it's it's part of trying to sort of make sure that your voice, you know, it can't match them, you know, for gravitas and, and importance and history and knowledge, but it can at least sort of sit in the same universe a little bit, and and I guess that's what you're sort of reaching for. Right, and I'm curious whether, how would you describe your voice just in general? Do you, I don't know whether you think about that or, or could offer a, a description, but <laughs> curious. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I hope that my, I don't, yeah, I hope that my voice is um, gentle. You know, I didn't, I, you know, I, I've not wanted to have a kind of, too piercing a voice or too grating a voice, you know, but, uh, and, and I, and I, and I hope that you, the, the voice, the voice, my voice invites, um, uh, listening, you know, um, that, it, that and, it, and, it, and it allows for listening. I, mm. I hope that it's never too loud to block out, um, a return, you know, to a conversation, um, that it always is inviting somebody to, to jump in and to pitch in. Um, I think that, I guess, is where I would, and I, and I think for the, the stuff that I do in vocal work, you know, that those are the kind of qualities that I would like to communicate that, that is, although it is a monologue to a degree, it is also an attempt to be conversational as well. Um, and, and although it is soothing, it is an attempt to be kind of dramatic within that, you know, I guess the other, other things that that um that i would that i would like to communicate with my voice well uh, yes i think that's it's very interesting to me and i think a lot of people i'm not sure about actors but let's say ordinary people if you will you mentioned like sort of uh, answering machines and things like that they really don't like the sound they don't like to hear their own voice mm -hmm. uh as an actor you 
I don't know, you probably don't have that luxury because it's it's your instrument, it's how you convey meaning and and then you've got to listen to it, I'm sure, to make sure it's coming across as as, uh, as you want it to. But would you say that you like your voice or is it hard to listen to ever? Or? <laughs> I mean, I think it's a it's a process. I think that because I'm I'm used to at this point listening to my voice, I um, I can I can hear when it works. You know, when if I'm doing something in uh-huh. narration, or even when I'm um, you know working on a film, or when I am um, you know, I often find myself instead of you know with all the video playback, you know, that that happens around Video Village as they call it now, where because you can just you can shoot a scene and then you can go back behind the tent and then watch the scene play back, but you'll often find me not doing that, but actually with the sound recordist and just listening to the scene because I can, I sometimes can tell much more about a scene and whether it's playing well, just by this, actually by the sound of the, of the voice and the sound of, of, um, of, of the interaction, the sound of the conversation, the sound of the scene. Um, so I can, so I, in that sense, I'm, you know, I can be critical of my, my voice. Um, but then if I do think it's working, then I really do, then that is something that I, then I'm, that I'm happy with, you know, um, and actually it is something that as I think as an actor, you know, you, you realize more and more that it is your instrument and you do think of it. I think, I think you learn to think of it the way that musicians think of their instrument very literally, you know. Mm-hmm. That um, that they can hear back themselves playing on their instrument and make certain judgments about what they're doing, you know, uh, and some of those things are based on things they are also bringing into the room, you know, with them, you know, bringing in their day, bringing in frustrations, bringing in, you know, all of these other things, and and the times when actually your instrument can be very pure and you are um, just in the zone with it, um, mm-hmm. I guess, and so. Um, so yes, no, I think the, your voice for an actor, I think your voice and your instrument in that way is, is, is very critical. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, I wanted to ask you, perhaps if you could compare the sort of narration you're doing on the elephant queen with ADR work, for instance, mm. there you're, you're very much playing a character, but how would you contrast those two? Well, ADR is, I've, always, I've had an interesting history with ADR because I didn't, I had no understanding, you know, when I first made a film or, um, was, you know, I was maybe in my late teens and I just didn't, it just had not been something, it wasn't something that I had ever thought about, that I would have to come to a room later on and re-record my voice saying the lines, you know, in a completely, completely different um, environment. I just hadn't, Put that together. I didn't know that's what you know, that's how they made films, you know. Um, and so the first time of going in to do ADR was was interesting because I think it's one of those make or break moments, you know, mm. where where for the rest of your life you either don't mind ADR or you loathe ADR, you know. And uh, and I think I just thought that it was kind of a game. And at, at some point, it just became a kind of game to me of watching the line. I think we had a line then, and then later on, I think it was beeps, you know, and the, the line hits the end of bar, and then you say the line as you said it, you know, on the day, you know, eight months ago, whenever it was. And um, and there I was, and I was probably 18, and I just thought that it was fun, you know, and, and I've kind of always had a little bit of my head that thinks that when I go into ADR, that it's a sort of fun addition to whatever has been going on. And then that has evolved into a kind of way of making these kind of micro changes that might might help a scene. So it's something that I find is quite exciting in its own way. Like it's just mm. quite, um, um, it's just a, another opportunity just to mm. make something, um, um, just to elevate something just a little bit more if you can. Um, in in a completely different environment, you know, and obviously there are times when it's very difficult, you know, that you you you're you you were in a zone in in performance, you know, in the situation, um, and it created a quality in the in your voice that um, that is very difficult to match in a, in, a, in a sort of different circumstance, and 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 I think that you know you do have to then really try and figure out whether 
any of that sound can be saved or whether it's a kind of belt and braces kind of thing or um you know whether you can whether the original can be can be you um but for the most part i do think that it is a great way of um you know at least an opportunity to just to continue to add something if you can to a performance and then um but i think that's wholly wholly different you know from from um narrating you know yes. because um you know you're just you're bringing in um the persona is is there it is that environment is the correct environment you know for um for um for what you're doing um so it's 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 really creating that space for that voice in that way you know mm -hmm. and that, i guess that's why i don't i don't really think of them in the same in the same way ah uh, yeah that, that makes sense to me that they would you know be, be a very different thought process altogether uh, but I am relieved to hear that you do not loathe ADR work. That would be unpleasant to, <laughs> that's how you felt about it. Um, that is strong. Yeah, that is strong. Yeah. Now, you were the voice of Scar in the recent uh, live action version of The Lion King. It was a very, very successful film for Disney. Um, how is that work different from doing narration on the Elephant Queen. I would think the similarity is, uh, I, I'm assuming you're, you're in an audio booth and the kind of the basic setup is somewhat similar and yet yeah. they're very different projects, of course. Yeah, I mean, there again, it's so, um, it's so different, you know, it's such a different, um, well, you know, and the truth is th th that experience was kind of different to everything you know, in its own way. I don't think I've had an experience quite like that um, mm -hmm. in the way that it was, in the way that it was um, just in the, I guess in the layering of it, you know, and, and the knowledge of what it would um, then look and feel like, you know, is, um, is, is so unique because obviously if you're looking at animation, you have historically an understanding of what that animation is going to, end up feeling like you know um and so then you can match a voice to a pretty good projected idea of what it's going to feel like in you know even if all the drawings haven't been done or if all of the renderings haven't been completed you can get a sense very quickly i think of what it's what its overall pattern is going to be uh, and then you can match yourself to that and there are probably examples um, out there from the same animators, you know, so you really do get a, a, a real sense of what it's going to be. But um, with Lion King, of course, th th there hadn't been anything like it, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, and, 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 you know, John Favreau sort of talking to me about it and saying, you know, that th the animals are going to look like the animals, you know, and, and me thinking, well, yes, but of course, you know, they will also look like an animation to some degree. They're never going to, and him saying, well, no, not, not really, you know, I mean, the best way to think about these animals and to look at these is to look at these animals in the, in the wild and then start to think about the, the vocal quality. And there were some uh, images, you know, that he had of what they were going for ultimately. Um, and, you know, and then at the beginning stages of where, of where they were, which were just the beginnings of these drawings and, you know, those, everything oh, was just very early. And so you were kind of, I was sort of making decisions about it in a way that was more, in a sense, more projected into my kind of uh, imaginative leap that I didn't entirely know that I had a complete handle of at the beginning um, than, I'd ever, than I'd ever done before, which was very exciting, but... Um, but also it was a bit of a, a sort of leap, you know, a leap of faith. You know, how do you do, what is the vocal quality of an actual lion, not an animated lion in, within the context of, of, you know, speaking English, for example. And, um, and, that, and that was a very interesting thing to sort of, um, you know, move into, I think, and to, and to look at. And then as the images came in and, you know, because we did it over a sequence, a long period of time, of coming back into the studio every once in a while, that um, then I would see the images coming together and I would see some of the renderings and really get a sense of it and, uh, and even hear back some of, the, uh, some of the vocal stuff that had already been done and really start to be able to modulate that to somewhere that I felt was, um, was, was working. Hmm. 
I, I, if I remember correctly, in the original animated uh, version of The Lion King, I think it was Jeremy Irons who, That's right, yeah. who, was, who was obviously a fantastic, uh, well, fantastic actor, but also has a wonderful voice. So, I mean, amazing. Yeah, interesting you know, contrast there. You have also recorded audio books. So I was looking that up. Um, in 2004, you did uh, the audio book narration for a, a novel called The Supernaturalist. Mm. And then a project very different of a dramatic reading of Othello yeah. in 2009. Uh, are, how do you enjoy doing audio book work? Well, I mean, I, I, I love it, actually. Oh. You know, I, just, I actually just finished an audio book called Piranesi by Susanna Clarke um, just a few days ago, um, which was, um, you know, just a absolutely wonderful experience. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to people sort of, you know, hearing that book. I think it's a phenomenal book. And, and I think that that's one of the things that, uh, that can happen with um, an audio book. And it happened actually as well on um, Ian Colfer's The Supernaturalist many years ago. Um, when, um, where, you know, you read a book and you're so transported and excited by that book, you know, that it's, um, that the opportunity of actually reading it out and, uh, and, you know, diving into all of these characters in this way is, um, so sort of wonderful. Um, and, you know, you spend a few days, you know, three or four days maybe, um, working on it and um, you know it can just be such a rich experience I think I think if you're invested in the book and you and you enjoy the book and you basically broadly obviously enjoy reading and enjoy the storytelling in this way it's such a remarkable thing to um, to do I think and uh, and I think I will always find um, you know audiobooks one of the the most you know one of the richest experiences that i that i have as as an actor it's such a it's such a sort of gift it's interesting to hear roughly how long it takes because of course i think if you're reading a book particularly if it's unabridged that's a whole lot of reading i'm i'm somewhat surprised that you can do it in 3 or 4 days <laughs> Might yeah. take 3 or 4 weeks but <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's it's a, it's um yeah, you'd be surprised, you know, it is that thing of once you kind of, once you lock into it and, you know, and you have, there's nothing else, you know, that is taking your time or attention and all the phones are off and there's nobody, you know, nobody's coming around and it's just you and the book uh, and you're captured by the story and you're excited by telling it. You know, it's amazing how um, how quickly the day flies past and how much you've done, you know, by the end of it, you know. Well, again, congratulations on your Emmy nomination as Outstanding Narrator for The Elephant Queen, directed by Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone. It is currently available on Apple TV+. Plus. I saw it again last night. It's really a beautiful film and, and fantastic narration. So thank you very much, Chiwetel. Pleasure. Thank you. And on behalf of the sag After Foundation, we want to thank you for joining us and sharing your experiences, your process, and your craft with your fellow performing artists. Thank Pleasure. you so much. Have a great day. And you.